what kind of chemicals would life produce? There? Right. And that's, that's part of the, that's the interesting thing, right? So that's what, you know, so we can use earth as an example, right? We can say, look, oxygen, we know there would be no oxygen in the atmosphere if it wasn't for uh, dimethyl sulfide, which is a uh, compound that uh, phyloplankton dump into the atmosphere. A lot of it that's uh, sometimes mentioned. And there was even, there was a paper that somebody wrote where uh, it was like, well, we're not saying we see it, but you know, there's a bunch of noise in the spectra right there. Um, so, you know, there's a whole list of things that Earth has done that are in the atmosphere that might be biosignatures. But now we're reaching an interesting point. The field has matured to the point where we can start asking about agnostic biosignatures, mm. things that have nothing to do with Earth's history. But we think that that would still be indications of this weirdness we call life, right? What What is it in general that life does that leaves an imprint? So one of these things could be the structure of the network of chemical reactions, that biology always produces very different chemical networks, who's reacting with who, than just rock and water, right? So, so there's been some proposals for networked, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, biosignatures, uh, information theory. You can use, you can try and look at the information that is in the different, um, compounds, uh, uh, that are, you find in the atmosphere. And maybe that information shows you like, oh, there's too much information here. There, there must've been biology happening. It's not just rock. Same thing for techno. We're, that's what we're working on right now. That for techno signatures as well. So how do you detect techno signatures? Okay, so with techno signatures, I gave the example of chlorofluorocarbon. Yeah. So that would be an example of, and again, that one is a non agnostic one because we sort of like, oh, we produced chlorofluorocarbons. Maybe they will, right? And there's solar panels, right? You can actually, the glint off of solar panels um, will produce a, the way the light is reflected off of solar panels, whether, no matter what it's made out of, actually. Um, there was a paper that um, uh, Manasvi Lingam and Avi Loeb did in, I think it was 2017. We've just followed up on it that actually could act as a techno signature. You'd be able to see in the reflected light, this sort of big jump that would occur because of uh, uh, city lights, city artificial illumination. If the if there's really like, you know, large scale cities like, you know, Coruscant in Star Wars or Trantor in the foundation, those city lights would be detectable, you know, the spectral imprint of those across 20, 30 light years. So, you know, our job in this grant is to develop the first ever library of techno signatures. Nobody's really ever thought about this before. So we're trying to come up with all the possible ideas for what a civilization might produce that could be visible across, uh, you know, uh, interstellar distances. And are these good ones or is these ones going to be hard to detect or such? City lights. So if a planet is all lit up with artificial light across 20 to 30 light years, we yeah. can see it. Yeah. If you looked at Earth at night from a distance where, you know, uh, looked at its spectra and you had sensitive, sensitive enough instruments, you'd be able to see all the sodium lights and the reflected light off of, you know, they, they um, bounce off the ground, right? The, the light bounces off the ground. So you'd convolve the, the sodium lamps with the reflected spectra from the ground. And yeah, you'd be able to see that there's city lights. Now, increase that by a factor of a thousand, you know, if you had a, 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 a trantor. And you'd be able to detect that across interstellar distances. Thomas Beatty did this work, who's now working with us. What do you think is the most detectable thing about Earth? Uh, wow, we just, this is uh, fun. We just have a, a Sophia Schief, just who's part of our collaboration, just did a paper. We did Earth from Earth. If you were looking at Earth with Earth technology for a bunch of different techno signatures, how close would you have to be to be able to detect them? And most of them turn out to be, you'd have to be pretty close, at least out to the Oort cloud. But actually, it's, it is our radio signatures still that is still most detectable. By the way, when you said you had to be pretty close and then you said the Oort cloud, that's not very close. But you mean like from an interstellar Interstellar distance. Because the real question, you know, what we really want to know is like, I'm sitting here on Earth, I'm looking at these exoplanets. Yeah. The nearest star is four light years away. So that's like the minimum distance. Um, so what can, if I'm looking at exoplanets, what kind of signals could I see? What is detectable about Earth with our current technology from the, our nearest solar system? Oh my God, there's all kinds of stuff. Well, like our, our, our the, 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 um, chlorofluorocarbons, you can see, you know, you can see Earth's pollution yeah. and, you know, I think city lights, you had to be within, you know, pr within the solar system. If they do direct imaging of Earth. They're going to need much more powerful. Yeah. But let me tell you what things. Let's let's talk about direct imaging for a moment because I just have to go on. This is such a cool idea, right? So what we really want, and the next generation of space telescopes and such is, we're trying to do direct imaging. We're trying to get, uh, you know, an image of a planet separated from its star to be able to see the reflected light or the actual emission from the planet itself. Yeah. By the way, just to 
clarify, direct imaging means literally like a picture. A picture. But the problem is, is that with the t- even with the 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 pre- the thing that's going to come after JWST, it's going to be a pixel, right? You're not going to get any kind of resolution. You'll be able to get the light from it, which you'll be able to pass through a spectrograph, but you're not going to be able to take a picture. But there is this idea called the Solar Gravity Lens Telescope. I think that's what it is. And the idea is insane, right? So the general relativity says, look, massive bodies distort space. They actually curve space-time. So um, the sun is a massive body. And so that means that the light passing through the sun gets focused like a lens, right? So the idea is to send a bunch of telescopes out kind of into the Oort cloud and then look back towards the sun towards an exoplanet that is behind, not behind, directly behind the sun, but is, you know, in the direction of the sun. And then let the let the sun act like a lens and collect, focus the light mm-hmm. onto the telescope. And you would be able to get, and they've done, like, it's amazing. Like they've already, this idea is insane. They'd be able to get, if everything works out, 24 kilometer resolution. You'd be able to see Manhattan yeah. on a exoplanet. And this thing, it sounds insane, but actually, you know, NASA, they've already got, the team has already gotten through like sort of three levels of NASA. You know, there's, there's the NASA program for like, give us your wackiest idea, right? And then the ones that survive that are like, okay, tell us whether that wacky idea, you know, is even feasible. And then, and they're marching along. And the idea is that like, you know, and they even have plans for how you'd be able to get these probes out into the Oort cloud on relatively fast timescales. You need to be about 500 times as far from the sun as earth is. Um, but right now everything looks like the idea seems to hold together. So probably when I'll be dead, but when you're an old man, (laughs) um, it's possible that something like this, could you imagine having like, yeah, that kind of resolution, a picture of an exoplanet down to, you know, kilometers. So I'm very excited about that. I I can only imagine having a picture like that. And then there's some uh, mysterious artifacts that you're seeing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's both um, inspiring and and almost heartbreaking that we can see. Like, I think we'll be able to see a civilization where there's like a lot of scientists agree that this is very likely something and then we can't. We can't right? get there. But, you know, I mean, again, this is the thing about being long lived. We've got to get to the point where we're long lived enough that so let's say we found like this is what i always like to let's imagine that we find say 10 light years away we find a planet that looks like it's got techno signatures right it doesn't end there like that would be the most important discovery in the history of humanity and it wouldn't be like well okay we're done the first thing we do is we big bigger telescopes to try and do those imaging right and then the next thing after that we plan a mission there right there's there we would figure out like with breakthrough breakthrough star shot there was this idea of trying to use, you know, giant lasers to propel small spacecrafts, uh, light sails, almost to the speed of light. So they would get there in 10 years and take pictures. And so we'll, you know, if we actually made this discovery, there would be the impulse, there would be the effort to actually try and send something to, to get there. Now, you know, we probably couldn't land, we could, but, the, you know, so maybe we maybe we'd take 30 years to build, 10 years to get there, 10 years to get the picture back. Okay, you're dead, but your kids are, you know what I mean? So it becomes now this multi-generational project. How long did it take to build the pyramids? How long did it take to build the giant cathedrals, right? Those were multi-generational projects. And I think we're on the cusp of that kind of project. I think that would probably unite humans. I think it would play a big role. I think it would be helpful. I mean, human beings are a mess, let's face it. But I think having that record, that's why I always say to people, discovery of life, of any kind of life, even if it was microbial life, it wouldn't matter. That to know that we're not an accident, to know that there is probably, if we found one example of life, we'd know that we're not an accident and there's probably lots of life and that we're a community. We're part of a a cosmic kind of community of life. And who knows what life has done, right? We don't really, all bets are off with life. Since we're talking about the future of telescopes, let's talk about our current super sexy, awesome telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope that I still can't believe actually worked. I can't believe it worked. (laughs) I was really skeptical. I was like, okay, guys, we all only, right, sure. We, we only got one shot for this incredibly <laughs> complicated piece of hardware to unfold. So what kind of stuff can we see with it? I, I've been just looking through uh, different kinds of announcements that have been detected. There's been some direct imaging. Yes, like a single pixel. The kinds of exoplanets we're able to direct image, I guess, would have to be hot. 
hot, usually far away from the, you know, reasonably far away from the star. I think you know, JWST is really kind of at the hairy edge of being able to do much with this. What's more important, I think, for JWST is the spectra. And the problem with spectra is that there's not sexy pictures. It's like, hey, look at this wiggly line. But be able to find and characterize atmospheres around terrestrial exoplanets is the critical next step. That's where we are right now. In order to look for life, we're going to be, we need to find planets with atmospheres, right? And then we need to be able to do this thing called characterization, where we look at the spectral fingerprints for what's in the atmosphere. Is there carbon? Is there carbon dioxide? Is there oxygen? Is there methane? Um, and that's the most exciting thing. For example, there was this planet K218b, mm -hmm. which had, they did a beautiful job getting the spectra and the spectra indicated it may be an entirely new kind of habitable world called a Hycean world. Hycean meaning hydrogen ocean world. And that is a kind of planet that it would be a, uh, you know, kind of in the super earth sub Neptune domain we were talking about, you know, maybe eight times the mass of the earth, but it's got a layer of hydrogen, of an atmosphere of hydrogen. Hydrogen is an amazing uh, greenhouse gas. So hydrogen will keep the, uh, the planet underneath it warm enough that you could get liquid water. You can get a giant ocean of, uh, uh, of liquid uh, water. And that's an entirely different kind of planet that could be habitable planet. You know, it could be a 60 degree warm ocean. So the data that came out of JWST for that planet was good enough to be able to indicate like, oh yeah, you know what? The models, from what we understand about the models, this looks like it's a, it could be a Hycean world. And it's 120 light years away from yeah. Earth. Yeah. And so isn't that amazing? You can, it's 120 light years away, but we can see into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We can see into the atmosphere so well that we can be like, oh, look, methane. Methane was a five sigma detection. Like you knew that the data were so good that it was like the, the gold standard of science. 